What are your thoughts on making a business selling custom artwork? I've been very successful with selling artwork in the past and still am. Why is this even a question? I do not really understand why people need it or choose to buy my work other than the fact of originality and the way it makes people feel truthfully. Hustling for artists. I'm, I've decided to do auto body collision repair. All right, I'm not going to read the whole thing. Uh, the whole deal is this is a person who's able to make money with their art, but they don't value their own work. And they're wondering, shockingly so, why other people value and work. I'm also going to jump into the rabbit hole and assume that this person's family thinks it's funny, and that is why they are actually moving away from something that makes money, they enjoy it, to do something because it other people can understand it. This is freaking common. This is freaking common with people who are artists, uh, people who, you know, they, they want to do stuff because uh, I'll, I'll share part of my story. When I wrote that first book, I went through the same thing. It's like, you know, you, you hear this stuff. Your writers don't make any money. Starving artists. And I'm going to really address the starving artist bullshit in a minute. Um, there are many people who talk about that, and they just, the, the thing is, it's crazy. If you go to Target or Bed Bath & Beyond or JCPenney's or Macy's, you're going to go to a section that's going to have home decor. And what are you going to see? You're going to see pictures. You're going to see art. You're going to see sculptures. And Marshalls is selling it. Target is selling it. it there's it's so many people are selling art, which means the market is huge and there's a lot of people in the art, which means art makes money. Art makes money, and many people devalue it because any kid can pull out a piece of paper and take some crayons and stuff, sell it, and you know, sell it and put it on the refrigerator in this art, and people devalue art. And because people devalue art, many artists devalue their own artwork. It is, um, it's kind of nuts. It's a little crazy when you think about it. It's um, it's common. It is very, very freaking common because one of the things that happens with this stuff is what I call uh, the, the creep of self-devaluation. You get people who can do something, but because it's not commonly accepted or thought of to be really cool or what, you know, everyone else is doing, then, you know, people um, kind of just don't really pay attention to it or they look at it and lose their freaking minds and it's like you know hey this is just art this is really not a way to make a living this isn't what you should be doing this isn't the job for a grown person or an adult and it gets really really funny because I'm looking at this like I don't know what this person's version of success is but you know, I'm really, really just kind of cracking up because I'm amazed that question was even asked. I mean, it, it is really, really crazy that I think about it. But essentially, what you can do to really set your in the artist on fire is to get over yourself because this is one of the things and you know being a writer and knowing other writers it comes there there's so many freaking layers of this thing of I'm an art I'm a writer and I do it this way and you know there's no commonalities which I said there's bullshit if you're a writer there's major commonalities the book must have a cover the book must be written and the book needs the most important thing of all readers there's a lot of commonalities but it's like oh no it's this esoteric boo boo the cat comes in and sits on my muse and I put down words and they're magical because they come from the star Zoran and it's really you know what writing is sitting in a chair and doing this until there are enough words on the screen where you say I'm done that's writing it's not sexy it's not ooh. 
And that's really the thing that happens with a little art because I can call art bullshit on a lot of artists because I used to paint, I used to draw, and I was damn good at it. And I was like, I got this idea. And what makes an artist, an artist who's productive or from artists whose happenstance is discipline. Where you sit there and you go through all those iterations like, damn, the hands are out of proportion. The eyes look jacked up. And you just keep working on it, working on your craft, and all of it comes together. That takes discipline. And that's why a lot of artists have to really get over themselves because it's just like, oh, my God. You're treating it as if it's this um, thing that is so esoteric. And here's another issue with artists. Many artists treat uh, making money as if it's a bad thing. It's just like, uh, I made some money from that. Mm. I smite myself. I smite I smite myself. Like they did a bad thing because they did something. Someone said, here's someone. It's like, it's been cheapened. You know what's cheap to me? Actually having talent that can make you money, but you're living in poverty because you can't get over yourself. You're living in poverty. You're like, you know, look, let me just say something. There is no fucking nobility in poverty. There's none. That is one of the silliest fucking things I've ever heard of. That I'm sitting here and I'm starving for my art. Because I, you know, I'm going to give you my take on it. And I talk to many artists and many writers, and I say this, and this is my advice to you. If you want to make something very esoteric, very artsy fartsy, go for it. But if your talent allows you to also do something with your art that makes money, you do that and you do the artsy fartsy. You do both. I write some really creepy books. There's some stuff I'm working on right now that I don't even know how it's going to go when I release it. But I am not Boo Boo the Fool sitting here going, yes, the world is going to want that. I don't know what the fuck the world is going to like it. I know I like it. I know I'm enjoying writing it. I know I'm having fun. But I know that storage auction book is going to pay the bills you know, at one point, or the Hustling on Craigslist, or the YouTube book, in course, or the 50 Laws of Hustling. You see where I'm going? I like writing crazy stuff and dreaming of stuff, but the reality is if you are an adult and you have obligations to support yourself, clothe yourself, pay for a place for you to live, you need money. And you may be like, oh, I don't want to talk about money. And this is the thing. Uh, there are many brilliant artists who can be brilliant business people, but because mentally they're like, you know, there's something wrong with business. There's something wrong with money. There's something wrong with getting rich. This is bad things. So if I get rich, I've sold out. There are many artists that feel like if I take the money, I, uh, I get rich. I've sold out. I've actually done something cataclysmic to my character that, oh, God, money cheapens my soul. I was watching... I'm still watching it because it's long. This documentary that one of the Johnson heirs of Johnson Johnson's made, and he interviewed Warren Buffett's granddaughter, who looks like she's got dreads and she's a big neck and she meditates and she does all this stuff, and she has pretty much turned her back on the money. And since she did this documentary, Warren said, "You're out the family," because he was upset, and that's his business. And I thought that was pretty cold, but. Money is such a thing that people who have it, because there was another guy, uh, I think, I forget what family he was heir to. Um, was it Mar? It was something well known. I don't remember it at the time. And he just kind of turned his back on the money. And he's living like a very average life because there was this guilt of having a lot of money. And I'm sitting there like, I really thought about this. It's like, where does this stuff come from? Then I thought about there's this notion that life should be fair. And if it's not fair, you should make it fair. I take my cues from the animal kingdom. When I was growing up, there was this one, the show that used to come on from the wonderful world of Walt, Walt of Disney was Animal Kingdom and Jacques Cousteau, where you would watch Jacques Cousteau go all around these oceans in the world and explore nautical life. And you would watch Wild Kingdom, where you would see the lioness go get that antelope. And if the antelope was like, you know, eating his Wheaties, he would outrun the lioness. If the antelope stumbled, he was dinner. That is the real world. That is the real world. You know, people, oh, you know, 
everyone deserves this. And you know, we get to this whole thing about deserve. I am a firm believer of you deserve what you kill. You get to keep what you kill. You you deserve what you earn. And this entitlement notion that we've got where people feel that they should have these great lives just because they're breathing, just because they're uh, out here, is really a falsehood. And this all creeps into the mindset of artists, because you've got people out there who feel that if they are slang in their art, you know, that street vernacular for selling, if they're slang in their art, that they're, they're cheaping it, that, you know, there are so many people that I see that if they just took a little effort and kind of just hit their head and get all that junk out of there, and if they just start, like, putting their stuff out and they're like, hey, you know, like people who can make silver and turquoise jewelry, say the cost is for the turquoise is five bucks, say the silver costs you another five bucks, that's ten dollars of cost, and then, you know, the time for you to put it all together and put your artistic spin on it. You know, many people would sell that ring for ten dollars or twelve dollars, which actually means they lost money because at some point you got to put a time on it because this is uh, one of my customers that I helped do this uh, last year who makes art and everything and her whole problem was she was selling her stuff too cheap and it was gorgeous stuff it was beautiful and I mean she we had a fight because you know she showed me some of her work and I said you should sell that ring for 150 bucks and this is what she said well the silver was only five and blah blah and I was like how much is your time worth she felt guilty by charging $140 for the time that she put into it and then this this is why I have to work with people because it's okay you want to make a living as an artist okay you've got to do some market research because she had a few things that sold very well and she's like I like to make one-off designs and I was just like slapping her upside the head trying to get that out of there I was like okay you've got a proven design that sells very well so what you need to do is go ahead and create processes of efficiency where you can make it faster and still maintain quality because you know in this room quality is very very important uh, people will pay for quality so you want to actually if you can increase your quality actually do so so she started making this this ring because it was a ring and it was a pendant and it was a brooch I think that was doing really well these three things are her biggest sellers and you know she was selling them for and she said what about people that have been selling to us like well they're gonna feel like they got a deal so she raised her prices, and what, what happened, what she thought was going to happen, it did happen. Her sales went way down because, you know, she was literally giving her stuff away. And I told her, I said, some of those people are buying your stuff, especially the ones who keep coming back, and they're reselling it, and they're doubling and tripling your money because your work's that good. And she sold way less than what she normally sold, and she made 50 times more money selling less because she had put... A, I well she didn't I put a price on her art and no she did not hire me her husband hired me her husband was like telling her all this stuff and it's weird it's like you know someone in your family can tell you something but then a stranger comes out and tells you the same thing it's like oh that makes sense you know and it just pisses off the people in the family because her husband was like I've been telling her this for years I've been telling her for the years and now she's making bank and her art is fun because now this you know I talked to her recently and she's like, well, it's even more fun now. And I was like, why? Because she says a lot of the financial pressure is off because I don't have to sell everything. It's like if I sell a few pieces, I make more selling a few pieces than I was making, you know, in a week working my old job, which I hated. And I was like, okay, so you see. Now, now this is the cool thing. This is the cool thing. And this is what happens when you start making money. And this is one of the things that I, I struggle with artists. It's just like... You can't just pull the stupidity out. And, they, and you know, if, if an artist sees this, they're going to get mad because I'm talking about them. And I really don't fucking care. You can't. It is just they're so caught up. I just want to make the art. I don't want to do the business part. I want people to just love me. I just, it, it, it just, it is so hard for them to grasp the business aspects. And what they don't understand is because when you grasp the business aspects, you can have more time to put into your art. If I was like with the art thing, right? L let's just talk about me. Say I wrote the novels that I'm working on, very part-time. 
and wrote that first. I wouldn't be talking to you. I would not have the time to um, ride around in the middle of the day and make videos on the way to the gym. I, I would not have that time. I would really, really be frustrated as an artist. Because, see, this is the thing that gets to you as an artist. Whether you're a writer, you're a singer, you make jewelry, you make clothing. Yes, people make clothing are artists. People make furniture are artists. Anyone that designs something and puts their artistic spin on you're an artist. The big thing is if no one's reading your shit, listening to your shit, or buying your shit, you get depressed. Because it's like, what am I doing this for? You know, that whole moment. And if you start selling your stuff and making money and putting stuff out there that people want, because this is another thing I have with artists. There's what you want to put out, like this book that I'm working on. I'm writing it for me. If it doesn't sell, I can deal with that. Because, like I said, I'm writing it slowly, and it's not like my main thing, and I'm not pouring my heart and soul in it every day. Because there are people who do that, and then when that book comes out, and then society goes, boo. <laughs> then they're all crushed and devastated when they didn't really ask society is, is that something you want you know everyone loves I mean it happens someone writes this book for themselves and then everyone in the world loves it it's just like ah that book speaks to me but everyone's not that fucking talented there are other people who will have to reverse engineer their talent they will have to go out to society and say hey what do you want then write that book and then you know that's what I, mean, I will say I'm fortunate when I started with this with the YouTube. I knew that people would like storage auctions. I knew this shit because it's like a modern day treasure hunt. So I had that perspective. But once again, it wasn't my first choice. If you were taking some of the courses I have up, you would know that I wanted to write the book first. But once again, uh, being in the storage auction business made me a realist. It made me understand that. You got to sell. I mean, there are so many business information points in the storage auction business where you've got this thing and the antique guy says it's worth X and you keep putting it up for X and nobody says nothing. And then you eventually are selling that thing for half of what you wanted to sell it for because the market says we're only going to give you half. I don't care what that antique appraisal guy said. I don't I, fuck that. I don't really care about that. But. That, you know, and time and time again, I was confronted with that. I want this, and the research says I can get this. And then it, it becomes a process of experimentation because some things you have to put in the appropriate place to get that money. You know, you could take an antique piece and put it on YouTube, I mean, not YouTube, eBay, and, you know, say it's for 15, you'll get seven. You know why you're going to get seven? Because someone who knows where the appropriate place is to put that thing is going to pay you seven, take it there, and make their seven Gs. Whereas if you learn how to find the appropriate places, because everything doesn't sell the same way in the same place. And that's kind of like social media. There's certain things that work on YouTube, they don't work on Facebook. Certain things that work on Twitter, it doesn't work on Facebook and YouTube. And it is really, each place has its expectations of behavior. So that's the same thing with your art. Say you train your clients to buy your shit cheap. You know, what you're going to have to do is get new clients. You're going to have to move to a different market. And that's kind of like what I did with my client because, you know, she was in one place and I said, well, you go here. And where she really makes her money is she went to some high end jewelry stores and her, you know, and this is where the quality came in and they're selling her stuff, you know, on commission. Because, you know, at first they said wholesale. And I said, well, you know, and their wholesale price was going to be. It was still going to be more than what she was making when she was selling her stuff for 10 and 15 bucks. But I said, okay, first of all, at some point they may want to go down. So if you start low, you're going to be putting yourself in a really precarious situation. So tell them this. Um, you won't charge them any money, but you'll put their, your jewelry in their store and you only get paid when they get paid. And, you know, for most business people, that's a, a fine. You know, it doesn't take up a lot of room. And, you know, she put in a nice display and, you know, she's in a few stores. Yeah, you can like go to a jewelry store and like, hey, I make this jewelry, and the thing is, it's gonna have to be good. It's gonna have to be distinct because sometimes, you know, the people on the store they actually make jewelry. But if your stuff has enough artistic merit, uh, they'll go for it because you know, if it's swank, as I like to say, and that's her stuff was swank. So she's in two stores, so that's some income, and she does shows, and that's some income. So she gets to work on her art. 
and now you know she's like letting her husband handle the business in and it was just really really funny because she fought him tooth and nail and sometimes it is just when people get a notion in their head it's like someone actually took one of those uh, rocket launchers and turned it upside down and drove the rocket into the earth and that's how embedded that idea in their head even if it doesn't make any sense even if all of the statistical evidence the empirical evidence, the personal experience is saying you know this is not the way to go they're still gonna keep going because it's like I got this ideal it's gonna work it's, and no it's not it's not and I just look at this because they could have did what they did without me I really call myself an entrepreneur uh, therapist because you know I'm the one that's like that's some stupid shit I get paid for that that's some stupid shit or no that there's there's leakage right you know see there cash is coming out of that end let's plug that up because you know most of the people I deal with are extremely smart they're not stupid it's just they're stuck on tribalism uh, ideology and poverty mindset you can have uh, upper income, middle class background like Warren Buffett's granddaughter. School was paid for, everything was paid for, going to the house. And, you know, I'm just sitting here. All she had to do was just go out in the world, you know, and do her thing. And I, I sit there and I, I look at myself. If I came from privilege, wealth, and money, what would I do? Because the guy who's making the documentary is called The 1%. You can find it on uh, YouTube. Is like there is this problem with economic disparity. Now I got a question for you. You know, I want you to really think about this. You have someone who is naturally muscular, just naturally muscular, or you have someone who's just really attractive, naturally, and then you put them next to someone who is not that attractive, naturally. You know what that's called? A disparity. <laughs> it's called a differential. It is a difference. So, in nature, there is disparity. There's economic. There, there's just intellectual disparity. There's physical disparity. There's a uh, resources disparity. There's some people who have fast metabolisms. There are people who have slow. There is disparity all over the place. But people like for some reason feels that it should be fair. I don't understand why there's a large percentage of the planet living off the land in huts. Uh, some people think that's cool. I don't think, you know, I'm not going to say for the people who do it that it's uncool because that's their way of life, and if they're happy, so be it. But I am not going to a hut. I am not even uh, putting that. And this is one of the reasons that I am not caught up on the fairness, unfairness tip. If we live in a system of inefficiencies, then I can take advantage of those inefficiencies and put myself where I want to be in terms of wealth and freedom. You can do the same thing too. So many people are trying to crank down the system and make it fair for everybody. And the thing is, it's just really an exercise in futility. There are people who are perfectly content not doing shit with their lives. There are people perfectly content uh, just getting by. And if that's what they want to do and they're not a burden on society, have at it. But this whole notion of everyone needs to go to school, everyone it's not going to happen. It's just everyone doesn't have the same motivation. And, you know, with artists, even if you're an artist, and many artists gravitate towards the uh, the poor thing, because one thing I noticed when I joined my writing group like four years ago, that if you write fast, you sell a lot, you're a hack. There is some merit in actually cutting open the wrist and bleeding on the page. You, I bled on the page. I put my heart and my soul into it. And one of the things is, I've done a lot of research in some of the most successful writers. When you do the research on the writer, a lot of these cats wrote really fast back in. And I mean, to me, in the 30s, and you're doing 10,000 words in a day on a typewriter, sheets of paper, ding, that's beast mode. You are physically working. You know, we, we have keyboards today. And I remember when I got out of the military and I took, like, some transitional courses at the vet center, and they call it keyboarding. They didn't call it typing. They call it keyboarding. The, the it, it just gets really, really interesting because this whole notion, and it affects artists most of all, that earning money for something, and, you know, I will go 
really on the God-given gift things because you know you hear people say, "Well, I don't own this. I just borrowed it, or I am being used, and I shouldn't earn money." And I'm thinking, if that is the case, and you know we don't need you don't need money, why do you need doctors? Why do you need dentists? Why do you need all this stuff? Why do you need psychologists? Why do you, why do you need all this stuff? You know, the whole thing is, you know, I did this with uh, your mental bank. I did this with um, so many things, you know, uh, the poverty mindset video. There, there's several videos that I did addressing this because until you clear this stuff out of your head, like all I had to do with my client, the money's not coming because you don't feel that you deserve it. And that's one of the things with artists. They don't feel that they deserve, they, they hope that someone will come and go, wow, this is magnificent. Oh, here's money. Whereas if they did a little marketing, many artists could support themselves. People doing t-shirts can literally support themselves. People doing music. And you don't know, talk about the music. Everyone's like, how can I make money with music? Well, number one, if you treat your music like a business career, i.e. if you like going to the club and singing karaoke, fine. You know, Luther Vandross, the guy that's you know had this incredible body of work, you know how he made money? Writing jingles and shit for McDonald's. That's how he got enough money to do his thing. Yes, a lot of those early jingles in the 70s were written by Luther Vandross. You know, back then, you know, I think he'd do a jingle, get five, six Gs. You know, this was back then when the house was like, you know, 12 to 20 G's and get 5 G's or something like that or even more I don't know what he was making and there are many people look at Lionel uh, Lionel Richard Lionel Richie Google his net worth he was with the Commodores but you know where Lionel made most of his money writing songs for other people writing country Lionel Richie if you didn't know he's actually black and he made a lot of money writing country songs which was predominantly white Let's let's discuss that. Let's discuss that. Okay. Because a lot of artists let racism creep into their work. You have artists who solely focus on their own ethnicity, and I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but if you have the ability to paint that and if you put some more efficiencies into your work and you paint a little faster, and then you say you go out and do this mural for this business that pays you 10 G's, which you know, enough money for you to live off for a few months while you work steadily on your other stuff. See, this is the thing that messes with artists. They want to just do their art and just focus and put 100% in their art and do nothing else. Or if they're doing anything else, it's like, you sold out. See their bill. You know, we were in art school and, you know, we were going to take on the world and we're going to do this thing together and you sold out. You know, I'm still here on the streets and painting these portraits of folks, but, you know, I am living that art life. You know, fuck you and your Ferrari and your and your fortune and your, and your your design firm and, and your and your wife and 2.4 kids. No, you sold out, man. You sold out. You're supposed to be here on the streets with me doing it raw, doing it rugged, doing it real. That's how we're supposed to be doing it. You know, you're going to get in that comfortable life. You know, yeah, I've seen a few of your pieces. You still have a little talent, but, you know, you spend a lot of your time, you know, paying all this other stuff for people for your design firm. You, you're just a sellout. You're just a sellout. <laughs> You just see this, man, and it just it just cracks me up. That is why in my courses I talk so much about tribalism. Tribalism will make people do things that just don't make financial sense because they want, don't want to disappoint the tribe or feel like they're betraying the tribe by being successful. And that's one of the things, you know, there's this common thing that artists should be poor. Now, with the Internet, you have many artists who are making more money than they've ever made before because they can go ahead and put their art somewhere like Deviant Art or sell it somewhere and start making money from their art. Uh, artists on YouTube. Uh, and I'm, let me just be really clear. We're getting to the point where a lot of free stuff's about to disappear in the next decade. And I was like, what? Because uh, YouTube's getting ready to kick off a lot of the independent artists. And the thing is, I'm like, you know, instead of crying about it, this, and this is one of the reasons that artists don't win. Okay, you're getting information. If I was an artist that was going to be impacted by YouTube's thing, you know what I would be doing? I'll do a video. Hey, dear fans, 
something may happen. I may not be here in a few weeks, months, whatever. What I want you to do is hit this link. If you still want to get the music free, just hit this link. And every time I put something out, I'll do special things. I'll have a special platform for you. I just need your email address. Now, here, here's the thing. If an artist could get, you know, because it seems to get a lot of people, if they can get like, you know, 50,000 fans, because, you know, you just see someone doing the cover and it's got like, you know, 200, 300, 400, 500 views. So they go ahead and put this email list together, right? And they get you 50,000 fans and then they put some stuff on iTunes, just do special stuff and go ahead like, what do you want to hear? Put it on iTunes. And if a thousand of them every month buy something at 99 cents, that's more money than they were going to get on YouTube. Now, if 2,000 of them buy every month, then, you know, I think, I don't know what the payout for iTunes is. I think it's like 70%, something like that. So, you know, 1400 bucks if 3000 buy, it's 2100 bucks a month out of 50,000 people. It's very doable. I'm not saying it can be done quickly, but if you're an artist, and this is one of the things that I teach with how to make killer money with YouTube and these other things, is you have to immediately get those people off of YouTube into your email list, your blog, whatever you have, where you can talk to them when you want to. This is one of the things that I put out there. And this is one of the reasons that it's just, there's so many people I see who can make so much more money, but you can't get that. It's just, it's in there. Uh, you know, it's real funny because uh, we're having this conversation because uh, I put some in Hustle University today about John Green's book in the fall of our stars. And he's going on saying like he won't go indie and why he needs a publisher. Now, let me tell you some stuff about John Green. If you don't know about who John Green and Hank Green is, they're the, they're the vlog brothers. They're, they're like started in YouTube 2006. And essentially they used to text each other these things. And then they start Hank would do a blog one day, and then uh, John would do a vlog. Now, and these guys also started VidCon. Now, I want you to tell you, just to let you know, that potentially between the YouTube channel and Vidcom, they're both making close to seven figures. Now, let's really early discuss that. You are making a ton of money from YouTube, and you're making, I mean, putting on the convention like that, they may net out at, you know, several hundred thousand apiece because they're brothers and, you know, they work very well together. And I'm not mad at them, but when you are making that kind of money, you don't have to go indie. You don't have to go into and you know his book got by the publisher and then there's a movie and all those other things but the whole point is if it wasn't for the YouTube channel and I want to say this maybe things wouldn't have went as well for him because when you got a YouTube channel with several million people and you know just to turn a book into a bestseller you only need 25,000 sales you know 50,000 sales you know you get to 100,000 sales you fan there there's only a few books per year that do over a hundred thousand in sales. In you know, real sales, not what I call and you know, just to give you the book game. That the, a lot of times they record these things as sales because uh, they'll do the big print printing and they'll ship these books. And since those books are shipped, they're classified as sales. If you know the book industry, there's something called remandering, which means the books that don't sell within a prescribed period of time go back. And they don't go back and adjust those numbers. So a lot of these books that were bestsellers based on that big push, if you really looked at the hard math, they actually tanked. And it happens quite a bit. But once again, that's about knowing the business side. There's many artists who don't, there's many writers who don't know that. It's just like, oh. And they're like, how come it takes me so long to get my money? Because, and that's another thing with traditional publishing. It takes you, you know, you get your advance. And let me go ahead and break it down to you. You get a third of your advance for signing, a third of your advance for delivering the manuscript, and then when the book like gets published, then you know, I think you get the other part. So, yeah, you hear all these big eye popping numbers for advance. They're not getting all that money. Then it's split between an attorney and an agent. But my whole point is that when you look at one writer or a person, you have to look at the totality of what they're doing because you got to think about it. If you've got somebody who is not, who's good with money, and they're getting six figures a year from YouTube, that opens up the doors for a lot of things. You know, it's just big, big things. I mean, I don't make enough to live on from YouTube, but it will pay, you know, a car note or it'll pay a mortgage for some place in America. And, you know, just direct money, not indirect money. 
But when you're looking at these people and you're going, yeah, yeah, you know, because we had this big discussion, and I was like, do you know how much money that YouTube channel makes from those guys? Do you have any clue? And then, you know, when they did the VidCon, I was like, <laughs> and it's clearly between putting up the videos all the time, I mean, frequently, because they've got a thousand videos in VidCon, there's a lot of energy that went there, and I think it, it was going in the right direction because they made a lot of money. Then, you know, he got this movie made, even made more money. So understand, when you're looking at an artist, you, you got to start really thinking beyond your art, and it's not going to take that much of your art time away. Uh, I think for anyone that could spend all day doing their art, you are in a great position. You're in a great position. If you can do your art and make money and make a living, you, you, should, you, you should go for that. Because I'm looking at this question, and it's like I'm making money, I'm successful, and I, I, I'm not doing this because you know I'm going to do auto collision. I, like I said, I really want to know what their ideal of success is because if you make enough money to support yourself, why would you do audio collision? I don't get that. I mean, I'm just thoroughly confused. Then I go, oh, tribalism, family. This is what you should do. Art doesn't make money. Why are you doing that? And this is one of the things. I, in Hustle University, I put this big question up. Uh, what is your biggest problem? And 75% said support, lack of people understanding. Family, yeah, you know, being an entrepreneur. Now, this is what's really, really crazy about all this. Most of those people go work at a job unless it's in the public sector, such as police, school, you know, some government type deal. They go work at a business that someone created. Someone was an entrepreneur, and they went ahead and built this business, and that's where they go work at a job. It's like, oh, no, I'm not going to do that because, you know, businesses are risky, yet your job is at a business. And if you think businesses are risky, why are you at a job? I mean, it's just crazy. But once again, it goes back to not thinking. It really thinks. So, you know, essentially, if you're an artist, you just need to get over yourself and stop going with this. Uh, I'm going to move the world with my art. I'm going to do all of this stuff. I'm going to make your art. You know, really make your art. You know, if you can't make your art every day of the week, maybe cut out an hour of television. It's like, okay, I'm going to devote an hour to this painting every morning. If you devote an hour to your painting every morning before you go to work, because this is one of the things I hear. Uh, I know someone's like, I got my writing desk and I got my writing corner. And it's all, ooh, uh, after my first year of writing, and it was very much a struggle, I can go in freaking Starbucks and write something. I can write something riding in the backseat of a car. I can write. I don't have to be at the writing desk and the writing corner and all this other stuff. Get over yourself. If you have obligations but you want to be an artist, make room for your art. If an hour a day is all you can do, if you do that every day, your stuff will get done, and you'll start to develop a collection. You'll put together pieces, and you'll you'll start to build these things and you'll start to uh, create and make stuff and part of this is your determination because you know this whole passion bullshit you know follow your passion the money will come no, follow your determination the money will come if you become really good at your art you'll make money I don't care if it's painting cigarettes I don't care I mean if you like really good with doing pedicures and manicures and turn it into an art, there's several women that have created these rap things and they become millionaires. Just doing it for themselves and it's like, oh, and they got it made it easier and easier and they package it up. But once you know, you start talking about making money and, oh God, I'm corrupting my artistic soul. You know what's corrupting your artistic soul? Being poor as fuck. That's corrupting your artistic soul. Not having no money to do the things you want to do. Being put in a position where you have to always be ass out because you can't get over yourself. Do your art. Make as much of it as you can and sell it and see what people like. And what people like the most, make more, reproduce, become efficient, and put it out there. And continue to make your other stuff. And stop being so butthurt when you make something and no one likes it. It happens. Just get over it. I've read, I've read two books that people are just like, it's like, eh, we don't like that shit. But it was under a pen name, and it was just like, okay, we'll, we won't do that anymore. <laughs> it just happens. It, it, the thing is, as you develop your art and you create enough income for you to live, you have more time to experiment. Everything's not going to be a home run.
Shit, you're going to file out. Sometimes you're going to strike out. Sometimes things are going to be base hits. Uh, that's why I'm on this thing of putting out so much of my art, which is hustling. You know, hustling is art. And you're like, oh, slow it down. Do one. No, 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 no. Because, see, I know how this thing goes. Now, I'm going to explain what's going on to you. Um, it's uh, the summer, right? We're six weeks, eight weeks, and kids are back in school in most parts of the country. You know what happens during the summer? You know why things get slow? So many people with young kids don't have money because now they have to spend money to put their kids in camps, daycare and stuff. Money that normally would have went to buying shit because their kids were in school. So the summer, everyone's like, oh, it's slow, slow. No, no, the summer is the time to, if you're an artist, paint as much as you can. Make as much jewelry as you can. Make as much chocolate. Do whatever you can to make as much inventory as possible because then before you know it, it's going to be on again. People will have more disposable income. And then, you know, I see this every year. And people are like, yeah, you know, all this stuff, you know, the summer deals, I can't buy all this stuff. If you're a hustler, and this is for the hustlers who are watching this, and you resell shit, break yourself. Break yourself. Put yourself in hock to get as much inventory as you can. Because what's going to happen once the summer is over and when the garage sales stop and all the people stop donating and having the garage sales, because you'll see a serious drop in inventory after the summer because people are going back. Then you can't get it. And then the demand goes up, you can't get it. Right now is the time to build and to create inventory and to make stuff and to put stuff out there. If you're an artist, and you know, I have a friend who uh, he actually did this. Uh, his name's John. He worked. At, he got a job at Quick Trip. He had his own company, you know, art and his own art company. And he got a job at Quick Trip, and he continued to do art. He never ever stop doing art. As long as I've known him, he's still doing He's never, ever stopped doing art. Never. Had to get a job, fine. Okay, I can't do as much art as I want to, so I'm going to do this job. And then, you know, but he never stopped doing his art. And he, you know, there's times he's made a living off his art. And if I remember correctly, I think he has like 15, because he, you know, he went to uh, New Orleans and he bought like 50 houses real cheap and I think that's all he does is he he's a you know real estate investor and he does his art. He still has his art company. So once again, uh, you know, another guy, Charles Bibbs, who's in Texas, who has a business degree. I don't know if you've seen Bibbs, but he has some these really beautiful paintings of black culture. And dude has a degree in business and he wanted to make a living. So he created a process, he bought the lithograph machine, and dude became a millionaire from his art. But what he made it. He controlled it. He put it out. He did the licensing. He did the important stuff. He did that, and he controlled it, and he made a lot more. Now, the regular artist would have just sold this stuff and made maybe 10 cents on the dollar and been happy. I'm selling. Now, Charles, Charles had that business knowledge. He had that business knowledge, and, you know, he doesn't, you know, it's art. Um, there, there's so many things that can happen with art. If you open up your mind to it, and if you are a downward for it. So let me see, since I did this hangout differently, because uh, I didn't hit it all up on, hold on a second with this. Let me refresh. Oh, here's someone. YouTube and the internet remove the excuse for the starving artist to be starving artists. There's so much money to be made on YouTube and the internet. And keep killing the Glenn. And this is from Picking Profits. I totally agree. Um, there is no reason for an artist to be starving. There, there's really none. Not today. There, there's none. And that's the thing. Uh, there's this girl. She's on Etsy. I don't know if I can find it. She takes books. I can't remember her name. She takes books. She carves out the pages. She puts in the uh, placeholders. And they are tablet holders. She gets her inventory for free. She sells these for $80, $90 a piece. Books. This, you know, people throw away, you know, she gets fancy books. You, and it looks like, you know, your thing's in a book. She just carves it out and puts a little band on it. Art. But, you know, people just like, I want to be Poe. I just want to be Poe. I just want to be. I want to keep my authenticity as an artist. <laughs> so if you're an artist. Especially, as uh, Picking Profits just said, uh, you can make an incredible amount of money on the Internet. And it's just going to grow. And the reason it's going to grow is the world's growing. 
Now there's um there's as these economies or cultures come online because understand everybody in the world is not online yet. I know that sounds like strange. And uh, I was actually hanging out with a friend this weekend and I was just watching because she's from uh, France and I was just watching, you know, because she immigrated from Cameroon to France and I was just looking at what stuff were people were using and there is so much potential when you look at it from an international perspective but if you're stuck on, you know, USA only, yeah, you 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 you're going to miss out. You, you're going to really, really miss out because what's happening in the world is huge. It's just really, really huge. And it's just going to keep going and keep going and keep going. So under the, understand, you got a chance to participate in this or you have uh, the ability to be ran over by this. That's really going to be your choice. And I'm speaking to artists because there are more people who actually fit the methodology of being an artist because you know designing websites you're an artist uh, designing logos you're an artist there, there, just there's just so much out there just something for you to think about so hopefully this provided a little clarity because I mean if you're an artist the world should be your oyster because as these uh, boundaries drop You'll be able to create your art, have it made in China, and have it shipped all over the world from China. Because that's something else that's coming. You're not going to have to, because, you know, the whole deal is with, because uh, you can do it with some factories already. They make your stuff and ship it where you want to. It never even comes to you. Because typically the old school method was it's manufactured here, they ship it to a warehouse, it creates the distribution system, then it goes wherever. In the future, it's going to be made in the factory, and it's just going to go, bam, straight out, straight to wherever it needs to go. So it's going to cut out, because what's happening is the Internet is just cutting out layers and layers of inefficiency. Because back in the day, you needed all these people. It's going to be, hey, factory's going to make it, and they're going to ship it out. It's going to go exactly, it's going to be made in the factory and go straight to the customer. That's going to be the future for pretty much everything in the future. Um Maybe next 20 years, everything's going to be done like that. There will be none of this. It's, it's going to create a lot of issues. <laughs> it's going to create a lot of issues because transportation is a huge part of many countries' GDP. But that's good. I'm telling you, 20, 25 years from now, it's, it's going to be different. It's going to be very, very different. I, I mean, it's going to be way different. I think uh, you still will have like stuff coming from you know cars. They'll make them, but they'll still have to be shipped, stuff like that. But manufacturing processes are going to improve in radical ways. You'll be able to come up with an ideal and have your own factory built and make it and ship that stuff. That, that's coming. And that's why you have to keep pushing, and that's why you have to keep being part of this. And for artists, I mean, just to give you an example, like if you create a bed, just say a bed. And it's real artsy. You can just you can sell that one bed. You can make a living off that one bed if you get enough uh, distribution of that one bed. You can make a living off of that. You can do this. But there are so many people who are stuck up on devaluing their work. It's kind of crazy. And that, that's the biggest problem. It's like, hey, why, you know, like this guy said, I don't even know why people are buying my stuff. <laughs> that's devaluing work. It's like, it's like, well, they buy it because they like it. That should be enough. That should be enough. All right. So. Just uh, let you know what's going on. If you like this and other stuff, um, there'll be some boxes here because I'm doing the Hangout. Because every time I'm on a different screen, it's going to pop up differently because Hangouts turn your stuff around. But uh, be sure to get your free audio book. Be sure to join Hustle University. And for those who make it to the end of the Hangout, I'm going to have like a special offer or some such offer or something like that. I'll just put some there. And, you know, don't tell nobody. Don't leave it in the comments. It's just between me and you, all right? You are my hangout boo. That's what you are. You're my hangout boo. So it's just between me, you, and my hangout boos. Boo, boo. You know, well, we're we're getting a little uh, little threesome-ish, foursome-ish, but you know that's how we do it on the internet. All right. With that, I will see you on the good side.